Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for braving uh, the weather to make it to the American Enterprise Institute today. Uh, my name is Gary Schmidt. I'm a resident scholar and, uh, and uh, I direct the Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies here at AEI. Uh, today's event, which is being co-sponsored by the Federalist Society, is a panel discussion of John Yu's latest book, Point of Attack, uh, Prevent a War, International Law and Global uh, Welfare. Welfare. Um, our format today is going to be quite simple. Uh, John will start off with an overview of the book's uh, thesis, um, and then uh, we'll follow up with our two panelists' uh, comments, and I might throw in a point or two as well. And then following that, we'll uh, open up uh, the floor to your questions and, and have a good, uh, robust discussion, I'm, I'm sure. Um, before turning the mic over to uh, John, however, let me first briefly introduce our two guest panelists, uh, Michael Lewis and, and Harvey Rishikoff. Uh, as you can see from the biographical materials that you have in hand, uh, both have had quite distinguished careers. Uh, Michael is currently a professor of law at Ohio Northern University. He's a former Navy uh, pilot, a Harvard Law graduate, and more importantly, a graduate of the Navy's uh, Top Gun program. Michael has written extensively in the areas of law, the laws of war and the laws of war as applied to the current war on terrorism. Harvey currently chairs the ABA's Advisory Committee on Law and National Security, and he's a former professor at the National War College, and he's also served as the chair at the college's uh, strategy department. Among other important posts he has held, he was the legal counsel to the FBI's deputy director in the late 90s and has had his hand in drafting uh, several important national security-related uh, presidential directives. Um, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, now let me introduce uh, John Yu. Uh, John has been teaching law at, at you know, University of California Berkeley Law School for um, 20 years, near, more than 20 years, and has been a colleague here at AEI for uh, uh, the past decade. Uh, former Deputy uh, Assistant Attorney General and Law Clerk to Justice Thomas and Judge Silverman, uh, he is the author of five uh, major volumes and uh, numerous scholarly articles on presidential power, the laws of war, and international law. Uh, his most recent book, the one we're talking about today, Point of Attack, is like his other books in that there is nothing, quote, shy or retiring in John's argument, uh, nor do his books ever lack for intellectual courage. Um, uh, who else could be a visiting scholar at AEI and write that the surge in Iraq, whose idea was given birth to right here in these spaces, uh, might not have been as important as we here at AEI claim? Uh, and who else would dare to argue that the current international law regime is problematic precisely because it discourages the use of force rather than encouraging it? Uh, I can see John now being offered a, you know, a record contract with the idea of remaking John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance into Give War a Chance. <laughs> uh, like all of John's uh, books, Point of Attack is a deeply serious uh, work and has, has great merit in pushing his readers to think anew their most deeply held assumptions. In short, while provocative, point of attack is provocative in the best sense, making all of us ask the important questions and in turn uh, thinking more seriously about what the answer should be when it comes to enhancing global prosperity and security. John, over to you. Uh, thanks, Gary, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at AEI. Uh, it's been my uh, home away from home for the last 10 years. And uh, like all uh, homes away from home, uh, the people are happier here. The food is better here. Um, it's just too expensive for me to live here. <laughs> and, uh, but it's been a great 10 years. This is my 10th anniversary here at AEI. And it's been a great time. And th uh, this book actually is the product of that 10 years because I started actually working on it when I came here um, after the uh, Iraq war. And this is my effort to try to make sense of the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and a lot of the other conflicts we've uh, been going through as a country. It's uh, also great to have Gary as the moderator. I couldn't think of a, person, a perfect person. He's uh, uh, one of the few people who shares an intense interest in the framers and national security and intelligence. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I had stolen one of Gary's great ideas from his dissertation for my last book on Thomas Jefferson's views on the executive power. Um, Gary um, actually has the view that uh, Jefferson actually had quite a robust uh, approach to the presidency uh, in practice, uh, but not in theory. And uh, I, I, I tried to uh, 
uh, disseminate that idea through my own work, I think is a really uh, important point. And you were the first one, I think, to realize that and to, to explore it. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be here with uh, Mike Lewis and Harvey. Uh, you know, Mike was on the front lines. Harvey was at the National War College, so he was on the rear lines, I guess, uh, in our war effort. It's great to be with them both uh, and look forward to the discussion. And I just want to make one recognition that uh, uh, my uh, mentor for many years, uh, Judge Lawrence Silberman, is here. And he's very angry at me for writing this book, but he claims I've stolen the idea from him. And uh, with many other things, I admit it, I did steal it from him, but he uh, didn't publish it fast enough. So <laughs> I got there first. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, I just want to pay special mention to him because he's someone I uh, started working for uh, right after law school. And he also combines, like many of us on the panel, that interest in national security and law, which is actually all too rare, I think. And, uh, he, um, so he was a, an inspiration for this book. He is entirely responsible for its faults, I might add. So uh, I just want to lay out the, the simple thesis and then uh, maybe uh, start talking about Russia and the Crimea because a lot of the, and maybe about uh, East Asia, although we're going to have another panel tomorrow about East Asia. Uh, the simple thesis, uh, and I think the uh, Russian invasion of Crimea just uh, you know highlighted this, is that the current international legal system of collective security, uh, I think, has failed. The one that centers around the United Nations and the UN Security Council, the primary rule is that the use of force in international law is illegal, e even criminal, unless it's in self-defense or when authorized by the UN Security Council. I think historically that rule uh, and its reliance on just war theory uh, actually is incorrect. That uh, the effort by, and this is a, really the work of Woodrow Wilson uh, in establishing the League of Nations, uh, the idea that uh, this rule, this criminalization of war, uh, harkens back and builds on the just war tradition that ran from Cicero all the way through the great medieval thinkers. Uh, and actually, if you go back, this one thing I just started with, if you look at the just war tradition, the just war theory, which is very wrapped up in uh, Catholic legal theory, of course, because of the church, um, just war theory actually uh, is much more nuanced and talks about lots of things we talk about today, like humanitarian intervention, um, preventive and preemptive war, uh, in ways that go well beyond the simple idea that any use of force other than self-defense is uh, illegal. I also think that institutionally, so uh, just as a matter of nor is it just countries have not followed the, this idea of uh, just war, criminalized, uh, war other than self-defense historically, and I think they aren't doing it today under the UN Charter itself. Uh, institutionally, uh, there have been plenty of wars since the UN Charter that have never been authorized by the UN, and were not in self-defense. And the UN, I think, has been powerless, fairly powerless to stop it. Uh, and again, the Ukraine invasion of Ukraine is just a good example. Part of it is the rule, but part of it also is the institution, that if you require the uh, full agreement of the permanent members of the Security Council uh, to authorize measures against any kind of aggression, and China and Russia sit on the Security Council, while well, they're going to veto any effort to respond to an invasion of Crimea, or looking down the future, any uh, military engagements that might arise in the South China Sea or uh, in Asia. Which essentially renders not just the rule being denied in practice, but also means institutionally the UN Charter, uh, our, you know, the American-led effort to create a, a system to manage conflict after World War II just doesn't work and it's failed. It's not, it's really not going to work for the future. That doesn't mean that uh, great power war is an inevitability or that it's something uh, that we can't uh, respond to and control. Actually, the other remarkable thing is that during this period after World War II, the amount of death and destruction from great power war has actually fallen to a low that's unheard of in human history. That by whole order of magnitude, the deaths that we have experienced from great power wars has fallen uh, to a level never seen before since the beginning, of, since the Peace of Westphalia and the beginning of the modern nation state system. There's an incredible record, but I don't think it has anything to do with international law. If you historians, um, political scientists, they say there's a number of different reasons. Uh, one primary one is clearly nuclear weapons makes it much harder, more expensive, and dangerous for the great powers to come to uh, conflict. 
the uh, balance between the superpowers for much of the Cold War actually had the effect of suppressing uh, conf 